Each Resident Evil film ends with a zoom out, revealing just how far the stakes were raised with each installment, naturally progressing the series to a global conclusion. So where could Anderson possibly go from here? The world had already ended, so the only options were a showdown with Alice and Umbrella in Japan and the fate of Claire and her convoy in Alaska. Seemed simple enough until Resident Evil 5 and James Cameron's Avatar came out in 2009, and clearly influenced Anderson to an unfortunate degree. He was shooting it in 3D. 3D is the 3D. I'm a complete convert to 3D and to shooting in 3D. 3D, 3D cameras. 3D, 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 3D cameras. 3D cameras in Resident Evil 5. Shooting in 3D, in 3D. In 3D, 3D was part of that in Resident Evil 5. Resident Evil 5, the video game. And then I played Resident Evil 5. 3D movie, 3D. And especially in 3D, 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 3D film, 3D film, 3D movie, a 3D point of view. Resident Evil 5. 3D, 3D, 3D. Resident Evil 5, the video game. Resident Evil 5, the video game. The fourth installment, entitled Resident Evil Afterlife, advertised itself not on its story, but its blatant references to Resident Evil 5 and its insistence on using 3D technology for more of the same over-the-top and nonsensical action. As a result, the qualities that once gave the series a sense of professional polish have now been greatly reduced or outright ignored. Unique production design has been replaced with a prison and a ship. The color palette is now strictly gray and black. The music, with its standout blend of orchestral and synth, has been replaced by this cacophony of noise. admittedly also possessing tracks that do contain genuine quality. Connections to the games are no longer cleverly infused into the story, but are now blatant references for the sake of popularity. Look, it's like Resident Evil 5. 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 Look, Chris is here. Because Resident Evil 5. The worst problem that Anderson created with Afterlife was his complete disregard for the original trilogy's consistency in tone, atmosphere, and story continuity. By the third movie, these elements began to shift to more over-the-top concepts, but still remained intact in regards to its sense of survival horror, and for the most part, taking itself seriously. They were all talking about what you did, and they're scared. I don't blame them. People have a habit of dying around me. Not just you. But now the trilogy, which had a definitive beginning, middle, and supposed end, had now transitioned into a Saturday morning cartoon, with over-the-top villains, forgettable characters, laughable effects, and a story that didn't know what to do with itself. Afterlife's story follows Alice flying to Alaska after she destroys Umbrella's headquarters in the first 10 minutes, a mission she should have never been on in the first place, and discovers that Claire's convoy is nowhere to be found, with Claire having amnesia after being mind-controlled by an umbrella device. Uh-huh. She then flies down the western seaboard for reasons we're never told, stops at a prison in LA, makes her way to a ship, and faces Albert Wesker who is keeping hundreds of survivors captive. And thus, we have a problem. How did Alice get hundreds of clones from California to Japan? Well, don't worry, because they're all dead now. Why does Wesker have the cure for the T-Virus when that's what they were trying to create in Extinction? All those powers of yours? Speed, strength, accelerated healing? Well, you can kiss all those goodbye. How did Alice survive a high-collision plane crash when she didn't have powers anymore? Not to mention the fact that she died in a helicopter crash in Apocalypse when she did have powers. Chris and Claire Redfield. You've really become quite an inconvenience for me. Why does Wesker say Chris and Claire have become an inconvenience for him when he's never met them before in his life? What's your name? Kmart. 
That's where they found me. Claire and the other. Fears back. Do you have another name? Never liked it. And everyone I knew was dead, so. Seemed like time for a change. Why does Umbrella register Kmart as her nickname when they don't know who she is? Also, her legal name is Dahlia. Every mediocre and inconsistent element of Afterlife would continue to follow suit to an even worse capacity with Retribution. A story that takes place completely underground where Alice and other game characters fight through simulated outbreak scenarios over and over until they reach the surface and make their way to Washington, D.C. Plot points are forgotten, character motivations are instantly changed, and slates are constantly wiped clean. All those survivors they saved? Dead. Remember how the Red Queen was designed to preserve life? Well now she's evil and wants to destroy the world. Paul, can I explain to you why the original Red Queen was so effective? Here, you're working on a budget of under $35 million. You're using a disco light and speakers as the projection system to create a sinister character with very little photorealism who tries to childishly warn our characters of danger. They try to deceive us, confuse us. I wouldn't advise this. Disabling me will result in loss of primary power. Say anything to stop us from shutting you down. The sound effects build. I implore you. Implore away. The Red Queen asks politely. Please? Please? And finally, you have her do something an AI should not be able to do. You're all going to die down here. And scene. All you're doing is running this scene into the ground by trying to repeat it. You're all going to die down here. You're all going to die down here. I've heard that before. Remember how Umbrella were left to rot underground with decreasing supplies, further casualties, and wanted to save the world? Food supplies down to 28%, 17 casualties, biohazard numbers increasing. Well now they have the resources to build entire cities underground for biohazard simulation tests, even though the world is completely destroyed. Remember how they were creating clones of Alice to find a cure, which was a bit of a stretch of the imagination? Well now they have a clone of everybody, because why not? Turns out they were cloning people from the very beginning, because clearly they have the budget to do that. Remember how Alice hated Rain's character from the first film? There's a child here. Your problem. Not ours. All heart. You haven't changed a bit. Oh wait, she didn't? I don't want to be one of those things. Walking around without a soul. You Remember how Alice lost her powers? Well, now she has them again. He pretended to give you your powers back. No, no, wait, he pretended to do that, I guess. Wait, what? What's that? You want more fan service? Well, here's Leon and Ada and Barry and Jill and Zombies with Guns and Resident Evil 5, and we've clearly taken a left turn at the traffic lights here in terms of consistency. If it seems like I'm not giving enough time to explain the entire story of these films, it's because there isn't much to begin with. What you see is exactly what you get. The film ends with all our main characters striking a pose on top of the White House, ready for one last fight against the undead and the Red Queen for some reason. Which brings us finally to the final chapter, which is the last nail in the coffin in regards to story continuity, connections to the video games, and anything resembling the atmosphere of the original trilogy. According to the final chapter, the T-Virus wasn't created by Charles Ashford to save his dying daughter in Apocalypse. It was created by James Marcus to save his dying daughter. The Red Queen wasn't modeled after Angela Ashford, she was modeled after Alicia Marcus, even though the creators confirmed she was modeled after Angela in the second film. In an early draft of the screenplay, there was a concept that this little girl had been the model for the Red Queen. And we struggled with trying to keep that in the film. It really required either immense amount of flashbacks to the first film, or you would never have understood it if you hadn't seen the first film. So ultimately we decided to drop the idea. What, you mean like this kind of flashback? My name is Alice. I worked for the Umbrella Corporation, the largest and most powerful commercial entity in the world. Or this kind of flashback? He's mutating. 
I want him in the Nemesis program. You know, when, when Mila sees her for the first time, there was going to be added significance there because the holographic version of this little girl had spent the whole movie trying to kill her. You two know each other? Hey, remember how the commandos in the first film left behind a bag of guns in the hive? That's some attention to continuity detail. Except, they didn't. Did they, Paul? Spence didn't unleash the T-Virus for his own gain in 2004, Umbrella released it in 2002 on purpose in order to cleanse the world and restart the world with only its chosen members. That's why they tried to contain it, right? This is a biohazard quarantine area due to risk of infection. You cannot be allowed to leave the city. And also find a cure? I will develop a serum that will not just combat the effects of the T-Virus, potentially reverse it. The Red Queen doesn't want to destroy the world anymore, now she wants to save it. Like in the first film, and has changed her face again. My satellites show there are 4,472 humans remaining on the surface of the Earth. They will cease to exist in under 48 hours. How do you know that? She informs Alice that Umbrella had an airborne cure for the T-Virus from the very beginning, and that she can use it to save the world which she could have done in Extinction. You mean this could all end? Correct. All this could end? Precisely. Precisely. This could all end? Correct. All this could end? Alice must then return to Raccoon City, whose geography doesn't match what it was in the second film, and enter the original hive to find the cure, while also encountering Dr. Isaacs, even though he's dead. A clown. I killed your clown. Claire Redfield, who just happens to reappear after everyone died in Afterlife. And finally, it's revealed that Alice was a clone from the very beginning of Umbrella owner Alicia Marcus. And she gets all her childhood memories back, because apparently, this is what the entire Resident Evil film series was leading up to. I can't. Just can't. Despite the fact that the original trilogy never concerned itself with Alice's backstory, nor did her character, this is what the entire purpose of the series was. Or is it fully plausible that Paul Anderson was making up everything as he went along, which explains every inconsistency throughout the entire second trilogy? Even if one could argue that all of these revelations and plot twists make sense if you ignore all the semantics and connect all the dots to stretch your imagination to the fullest, why did the series need all these supposed twists and revelations when the story could have succinctly ended three movies ago? The likelihood that Anderson's experimental survival horror fairy tale was supposed to always be the story of a clone regaining her memories of childhood is very, very slim, and makes one wonder why would they need six movies to tell such a ridiculously retcon story. It's almost as if Paul Anderson was a genuine fan of the Resident Evil series, who also wanted to make his own Alice in Wonderland art film, and was given two more films to finish the story, but was then given carte blanche to do anything he wanted for a second trilogy. But as Alice says at the beginning of the film, my name is Alice, and this is my story. And instead of zooming out at the end of the movie, the camera zooms in on her eye. Because it's like poetry. They rhyme. Wait a minute. Can we take a look at that scene again? No, I'm not talking about the fact that Mila Jovovich's face is clearly copied onto a stunt woman's head. Did anyone else hear that? Why does that sound familiar? I can't... I don't... I don't... I can't... I don't... When putting both of these trilogies side by side, it's easy to see how they are two drastically different series, from cinematography, to visual effects, and most importantly, tone. Look at what happens when you go to an actual location to film, and this. Look at what happens when you give a movie in 2002 a very modest budget and takes place primarily underground, 
compared to a movie in 2012 with a very high budget and takes place primarily underground. There is a huge difference between this... Rain? Rain? What? We have to do something about your wounds. I'm fine. I said I'm fine! <laughs> And this. This? And this. This? And this. There's only one problem with that plan. Stop. Right, right there. And what is that? I'm not on the menu. Even the titles of the first three films remain consistent. In other countries, the first film was titled Resident Evil Genesis, as in the creation of life, which leads to apocalypse, as in the event that will bring the end of life and concluding with extinction, the finality of all life. What comes after death? Afterlife. Which makes sense, but in the context of the film, doesn't apply to anything. Which leads to retribution. Retribution for what? What exact retribution is trying to be achieved in this movie? The final chapter. What? They're chapters now? When did these movies turn into books? Both film trilogies are completely separate entities, and I implore fans and newcomers alike to see them as such. However, they both share a specific factor. One of the elements of the Resident Evil game franchise is its perfect blend of the emotional dread of survival and suspense mixed with over-the-top action set pieces and cheesy dialogue. Sorry, but my dance card is full. These elements have always gone hand in hand, with some installments finding a better balance compared to others. It can be argued that the second film trilogy simply followed the same pattern that the games were at the time, with a lot more cheesiness and over-the-top action taking precedence over horror. Compare Extinction to Resident Evil 4. Both took each of their series in a drastically different direction, with Resident Evil 4 taking place in Europe, replacing zombies with parasite-infested villagers, and focusing on more action-oriented gameplay, all the while using horror as an undercurrent. Extinction takes place in a post-apocalyptic world and focuses on a more global sense of humanity's survival, while also increasing the action and suspension of disbelief ideas. For me, both of these installments reached a level of uniquity that I could still enjoy despite being vastly different from its predecessors. Whereas Resident Evil 5 and 6, as well as Afterlife and Retribution, go way too far for my own tastes, focusing primarily on action-oriented gameplay and throwing away practically everything resembling survival horror. I don't make films for critics, and I'm not particularly interested in what they have to say. People see my films, and they cheer, and they clap, and they are the kind of movies I like to see myself. Audiences are my barometer. Because of this, Anderson gave no effort to paying attention to his own continuity and tone, and overloaded the last three movies with plot holes, pointless cameos, and embarrassing visual effects. Well, one of the advantages we had for the movie was because we were shooting in Berlin, <clears throat> where they have a fantastic 
basically an underground labyrinth beneath the city, which is where they're rebuilding the U-Bahn system, which is their underground transit system. And uh, we had access to that. So we had all these underground train stations and tunnels and like this great stairway. These are all real locations. And because we you know, used locations, we saved a lot of money rather than having to build everything. And also it gives the movie, I think, a, a feeling of reality, which I think for horror is very important. I think the more realistic you can be, the more scary it is. Yeah, you said it, buddy. Wait, you said that? The more realistic you can be, the more scary it is. The more realistic you can be, the more scary it is. The more realistic you can be, the more scary it is. At the end of the day, it all depends on how you like your Resident Evil cooked. Horrifying and emotional, or over-the-top blockbuster. To be fair, the games themselves also possess several plot inconsistencies and retcons, but at least they have the excuse of being passed around to many different writers and development teams, whereas Anderson was responsible for directing four of the movies and writing all of the screenplays. As of 2020, the latest three installments in the game series brought it back to its serious horror roots, while also knowing when to have fun with itself. And luckily, these installments have received long-awaited familiar praise from fans and critics alike. Whether the film medium will attempt to recapture that same serious tone is unknown. The closest we've gotten to another adaptation was the proof-of-concept short film for a TV series, Resident Evil Arclay, which focused on a police investigation into a suicide leading to a deeper conspiracy. The film is shot, acted, and scored with a serious horror tone in mind. Although the project was cancelled, it begs the question what the potential for a serious Resident Evil TV series could be, or whether the series really needs another live-action adaptation to begin with. Regardless, the Resident Evil franchise has continued to find new fans and please its original core audience by exploring new ideas and remastering beloved original installments. Here's to hoping for continued success for a series that has thrived for nearly 25 years and doesn't show signs of dying anytime soon. powerful, especially against shitty films.